Well, why are we here? Well, it all started uh, a long time ago with our ring laser recordings, uh, where for the first time we measured one single component of rotations around the vertical axis. And of course, seismology needs a portable sensor. And of, as of a few years ago, thanks to iX Blue, we have a, a commercial portable broadband sensor for the first time. And of course, there are other groups uh, in the world who developed uh, basically in an academic environment um, rotational devices. And um, we always said, once we have a certain number of uh, portable sensors uh, available <coughs> that can be used in the field, we should very soon organize an experiment where we compare these sensors. And that's, that's what we're doing here. Welcome, I am from the Warsaw Military University of Technology in the Poland Warsaw and we come here to, uh, in winter time but on the wonderful autumn time to take a pa uh, participate in the excellent, excellent experiment. I don't believe so we can to, uh, to take here so many different devices located in one point to make the common experiment and uh, uh, we work about more than 10 years about to develop a uh, fiber optic sun, uh, fiber optic rotational seismometer based on the Sanyak interferometer. I believe it is the best solution to detect the rotation component because it's detect is in the direct way from the uh, fundamental physical effects uh, Sanyak or von Laue Sanyak effect. We, yes, we are uh, um, today uh, in, uh, in, in uh, I think, a major experiment, uh, which is like um, uh, uh, the end of the development, and I would say the start of a, of, um, of a commercial development, uh, deployment, I would say, of Blue Sace 3A. We start three years ago uh, with, um, with an interview with the team from Munich, LMU uh, and TUM, T U M, and uh, and they they came to us to to let us know that there is definitely something to do with fiberoptic gyroscopes in seismology, in rotational seismology, and now we are um, here uh, uh, installing um, almost a dozen uh, of uh, of Blue 3A and, and and several other instruments. To, to compare, to check, and to make, to allow the science to happen with this new kind of instrument. So where are we? We are now uh, at the border between the, yes, the development phase and, and, and I hope the, the commercial deployment of this kind of instrument, because I, I do hope that we will show here that uh, there is definitely a new science to, to arise, to raise uh, with this kind of technology.
Schuss kommt. DAS cable, a distributed acoustic sensing cable, which is basically just a normal fiber optic cable with a fancy interrogator at the end. Uh, so we shine a laser down the fiber and the imperfections on the inside of the fiber uh, cause reflections of the signal. And then you can use the travel times of those reflections to determine where those defects are. And when the cable is strained by, for example, seismic activity or even a person walking along it, those travel times change and you can determine where along the cable those things happened and potentially also get reasonably good physical amplitudes out of them as well. Um, so the theory is that DAS cables could work as pretty cost-effective, other than the interrogator, but fiber-wise, pretty cost-effective uh, networks of seismic sensors, as you can have sensitivity all along the cable. Okay, super. So if you record seismic waves, there's usually a translational component, but there's always a rotation as well. And in the past, people just discarded the like rotation of the ground. But it's actually important to record it because it might have an effect if um, you just use a normal seismometer and that records the translation. But then if there's a rotational component, that will be in the recording as well. So if you record the rotations, you can correct the normal translational signal for tilting motions. Um, but there are also other um, applications, for example, like my background is seismic arrays and if I use seismic arrays then I need a wide network, I need a certain geometry and I have, I have a frequency dependence and if I have a rotational sensor I can use like one normal seismometer and a rotational sensor. 
combine them, put them really close to each other, and I'm not like I'm not. I don't need that much space anymore, so it's, it's much handier for me, but I can get similar results, hopefully. So this is one thing that I would like to test as well. Um, well, it's difficult to install sensors on a volcano and it becomes more difficult if you want to install an array because then you have multiple instruments, let's say seven instruments, and you want a certain geometry and you want to have the instruments all at the same height, but usually volcanoes have steep flanks. So it's difficult to install your array because you need to take height differences, for example, into account. If I'm going with a rotational sensor and a normal seismometer, I just put them at one spot close to each other and I can use the whole frequency band for my analysis. So beforehand, I don't need to know whether I'm looking at low frequencies or higher frequencies. I can just choose the frequency band afterwards. Yeah, it's important because we are doing some experiments regarding applications of the rotational sensors in mostly in structural engineering, in uh, structural monitoring of the uh, of the civil engineering, infrastructure, uh, frames, beams, particularly reinforced concrete. However, also the uh, seismological aspects are interesting for us. Uh, we have uh, some access to the sites of induced seismicity in Poland. We have some results from this strong induced seismicity effects using uh, some seismological instruments, but th this was a good opportunity to put in action some of the other smaller devices. Mm -hmm.